アロハロハチャリー、アワユー。おはようございます。How are you? We are, we are live, Charlie. We are live. カカですかいや、カカネラ・マクマーダ。How are you, bro? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. Uh, just trying to clear up my space here so I can set my stuff up. Let、well, me got to share this thing for Patsy. Share now. There we go. Wow, man. Welcome back, bro. Welcome back. It seems like forever. Yeah, it seems like we went to Disneyland and back. Yeah, yeah. man, I really wish we did. <laughs> Patsy said Las Vegas and back. Uh, no, today, Las Vegas, you heard today alone? 2,000 cases just today. Yeah, it's out of control over there. And obviously, I mean, you saw the videos、uh, being posted from、uh, the Fremont experience. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's scary, man. It's scary. And、uh, yeah, it's scary. And, and it's not going to stop. You know, it's not going to stop. It's unfortunate.、Uh, you saw our numbers today. Finally, they came out with numbers. Yesterday, they didn't have numbers because they changed the reporting process one more time. They're going back to reporting every day at noon. You know, and、um, so today we had like 97 cases.、Uh, the, but the troubling part today was,、uh, and this is going to go right into what we discussed, what we're discussing tonight. With Dr. Lee Evslin.、Um, we had another case this year after the state's report. Kauai、um, came out with uh, uh, a press release. One more case, took the pre test 72 hours before they flew, got the result after they arrived on Kauai. That makes number nine now. Nine visitors have、uh, arrived on our island. And they have、uh, got their results, their positive results back、uh, after they have arrived on Kauai. So,、uh, about 6 15, 15, the, the county released another press release. Mayor Kawakami proposes two emergency rules to Governor Ige regarding、uh, relating to COVID 19. He is asking the governor. To go back to his original proposal requiring、um, the pre,、uh, pre uh, post arrival test with a three day quarantine. So remember the one got rejected? Yeah. He's asking for that again. In addition, he's asking for proposed emergency rule number 22, which would require all travelers to have their negative test results uploaded to the Safe Travels program prior、right. to flying to Kauai. Should test results not be available upon arrival, the 14 day quarantine would be required. In other words, if you, you, you're just, if you cannot get that results before you leave, then the results don't matter. You will quarantine for 14 order, days. In order for that to take place, what will happen is you know, the day they go and they take their test. Say if they take their test on the 72 hour window, correct? We're assuming now they're flying here. And their test is not back because probably they took the test one day before they departed, right? Right, right. So it's not available. But if、right. they took it 72 hours prior to departure and it was the fault of the lab not getting the test to them, right, in 72 hours, then something has to be done. You cannot put it on, I don't think you can put it on the traveler. You need to put it on the lab. Well, You know, Charlie, it's like if you made reservations for a restaurant at 7 30, and this has happened. I know it's happened. Maybe not to you because you, you guys are prominent people, but <laughs> it, it has happened to us where you make reservations for 7 30 and you get there, and there was an unexpected uh, uh, rush or something happened. You know, some people take longer for eat,、yeah. and you got to wait, and you got to wait. And, you know, to me, If you are choosing to fly during a pandemic, right now what's happening is a lot of the testing facilities are maxed out. They, they, their appointments are booked. So, because the, the surge what, of. What you're、tourists. saying, you just, you, just, you just run the risk. You either you get your、Correct. test or not. Yeah, okay, I get it. Correct. But, as, long, 
as long as they know that, as long as they understand that. Well, I will tell you, and no, I'm not prominent, but I, I know what you're talking about the restaurant because my wife and I did make reservations um, at Jack in a Box and we went through the drive through and we was way, you know, the, the, the Lihue Jack in a Box. We had our reservations that night for dinner and went through the drive through and we actually was at um, uh, Kauai Community College standing in line from over there. So by the time we reached Jack in a Box, <laughs> yeah. it was just known as Jack. <laughs> we got well, <laughs> I know there's been probably one or maybe even twice that Patsy and I went to meet you and your lovely wife for dinner and we got there before you and we get up there and they give us the stink eye like, bro, we, we, we're, we're sold out. And then they look at you and they go, can we help you? Yeah, we're here. We're meeting the, the owners. Oh, oh, come inside, come inside. And wow. Yeah. So I, I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but we have, we, the, us common folk, we have, I mean, we, anyway, tonight we have a one hell of a show, you know, uh, nothing happens by accident. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe that things happen for a reason. And, uh, oh, first of all, Melissa Bolton, I just want to say thank you to Melissa, our good friend, our, uh, very loyal viewer. Uh, I got a box today from Uncle Charlie. Apparently, uh, he, he sent a box of goodies for my wife and I. And um, Charlie, thank you for bringing that, uh, you and Steph for bringing it all the way into Lihui. But it was a box of masks and wipes and uh, okay. hand soap and sanitizers and um, antacid. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. We love you so much. Uh, we appreciate you so much. And uh, thank you. Anyway, but so this morning, Charlie and I gets an email from Dr. Lee Evzin, who is one of the most respected doctors around. Um, we've known Dr. Evzin for 29 years now, uh, since my son was born. And he emailed us this morning with a study that was released yesterday from the University of Washington uh, experts that did a study on, uh, on the prevalence and the infectious rates of our visitors coming to Kauai, I mean, uh, coming to Hawaii. And I'm not gonna steal his thunder. He, he is going to uh, share that study with, with us tonight. So before we go on, Charlie, you get your high quality graphic. Um, please do this for us. You know, please do this for us because tonight's information is it, it falls right in line with what we've been saying for so long. We know that the Lieutenant Governor, uh, based on his advisors and the, and the, the state, uh, Dr. Mugi Ishii from HMSA and all came out with this one in a thousand passengers will come in infected, undetected. Well, we need, we're not doctors though. But Charlie came up, he did a little analysis uh, about a week ago with the numbers that we did have. And Charlie, you wanna, you can share that with, with that, uh, share that with the viewers about how, how what you determined in your non-scientific, non-medical, but common sense approach. Well, basically it was, we knew how much we had of those arrivals, right? At the time was, I, I guess it was gonna be 12. And they said it was on 15,000. So when we discovered that, you know, it was for the state, not only for Kauai. So I took a, a, a knockoff of the 15,000 and said, okay, to the best of my guesstimation, we had about 3,000 arrivals. And so I ran that number. And what it showed was that it was basically one in 250 or four, right? Four for every, um, four for every, a uh, thousand, that, that was my numbers. And I was, just, I was just doing rough guesstimates. And I said, this is no one in 1000, no way, no way. It's not happening that way. Yeah, we, we, we knew that the one in 1000 was a stretch only because of what we were seeing in other areas like Alaska and everywhere else that had similar uh, programs in place. But nonetheless, that's what was promised. That's what was told to us. Um, a lot of things were promised. I mean, you know, the 20% the surveillance testing that was supposed to be done, that never happened. The 10%, they went, that never happened. Uh, the one in a thousand, obviously, 
is not true. The, the thing that bothers me was the fact that the surveillance testing, surveillance testing was after they spent a few days on in Hawaii, we was, were gonna test them. And we we're gonna see how many of them were positive after the infectious period, the latency period. Well, come to find out the numbers that the state was putting out was the numbers of tests that they were giving to the big island passengers when they arrived, the mandatory testing. Mm -hmm. That's not surveillance testing. So, you know, th that's why, uh, you know, the faith, the confidence, the uh, it's just uh, integrity of the state, in my opinion, has, has just dropped. And um, that's something that they're, they're going to have a problem. Remember, Charlie, I think it was our first or second, maybe probably the second month we were on, on, uh, on, on the air. And maybe it was the third month. And I said, you know, I, I made the comment that the bigger problem, remember now, that is when we didn't realize this thing was going to go for eight months, nine months, 10 months. We, didn't, we thought COVID was going to go away at some point much sooner. But I remember making the comment that the bigger problem this state will have will be to regain the trust and confidence from the public. And, uh, and it went worse. It got worse after that. So that that's going to be a huge thing. That statement you made, I remember it clearly, was right after I broke the news about my brother's death. That was back in April, latter part yeah. of April. You came up, you, you, you said it, you said it. In order for, and basically we we're talking about how do we, was messaging and how do we get people to buy in? Because the question always remained, and you brought up that scenario. Well, when we get shark attacks, you, you have no problem telling us what beach they was at. They got attacked at. And you made it perfectly clear. And we tried to, yeah. The excuses started back mm -hmm. then. And, you know, we, we, a lot of it was forgivable because... It were new. Everybody was new. This whole thing was new. But as things were being done on the mainland in other countries and we elected not to follow, that's that's when I, we, I knew we were going to have some issues. Uh, to the governor's credit, I want to thank the governor for uh, moving forward with the mask mandate, the statewide mask mandate. Uh, and he, he he did sign it. It's 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 going to be in effect, or it is in effect, and the counties will be enforcing it. Uh, I don't know what happened to Charlie. I hope he's uh, temporary. But anyway, so I want to thank the governor for that. I mean, yeah, you know, and a lot of people will say it's too late. Well, better late than never, and that's being done. So I appreciate the governor for doing that. The other thing is, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that the governor will grant the request from our mayor. I, Charlie, I'll bet you a bag of Snickers that he's gonna reject both of those requests. Well, I, I, I'm gonna take you up on a bit and I'll tell you the why, I'll tell you the reason why. I think the first go around, Dr. Berman was very quiet because you know it, it was still Department of Health trying to uh, get the lay of the land, but she made it perfectly clear the last go round of her concerns, and I think now there's even a greater concern uh, because because of the prevalency, right, of how it's of how it's happening. So I think that might be a game changer in and of itself. I hope, but if not, I I do I do have I if I lose that bet, I'm a First, a man of my word, if I lose that bet, I will give you my a bag of M&Ms, yes. Uh, I'll, I'll bet you a bag of uh, Snickers. If I lose, you buy me a bag of Reese's peanut butter cups. Reese's peanut butter cups? No, if he loses, yeah. he's going to eat a bag of carrots. And if I, no, 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 don't, don't go, with, don't go there with carrots. That's, that's, that's not, I, I, I don't play the game. <laughs> And I, didn't no, I made the bet Snickers. I made the I made the bet Snickers. But you know, to keep peace in our household, uh, if I lose, uh -huh. I mean, if I win, you can buy me a bag of carrots. There you go. Okay, you okay. got it. Doctor Aslin, how are you, my friend? Welcome back, sir. Welcome back. Thank uh, you. Thank you. I was just explaining that uh, nothing happens by accident, and and things happen for a reason. And this morning, uh, you sent us an email sharing a study. That was just done. Uh, I saw the date on that thing was yesterday. Uh, so we didn't, uh, didn't want to steal your thunder. So 
we're just gonna let you uh, let you take over and share with us. We talked about how most of us question the one in a thousand uh, figure that was given by the state by the lieutenant governor. We questioned that for many reasons, mainly because that was not was what was that was not what was happening in other jurisdictions, and you know, we saw ourselves being no different than any other. Uh, like Alaska or whatever. So anyway, with that, Doc, thanks again for joining us uh, on late notice. But the floor is yours, sir. All right. So the same thing. We heard this number over and over that one per thousand basically would come in. And we have this group of physicians and others that are um, been kind of active and looking at numbers and trying to understand what's going forward and maybe playing a positive role. Anyway, we kept asking, how did you get this one in a thousand? And we didn't ever really get an answer from anybody except one person. And I don't think I'll mention the name because he was nice enough to give us the formula, but he was one of the leaders that um, was, I don't know if you hear all these sirens, something big happening out in Kapaa. Anyway, um, he was one of the leaders of this initiative to open the state up. And he did give us the formula. And, um, it basically showed this one in a thousand and it had some strange things in it that we kept asking about. For example, they used a prevalence of 1% saying, okay, 1% of a traveler's a traveling population will have the disease. And then they multiplied that 1% by 0.3 and then 0.3 again, which brought them down to basically one per thousand. If you multiply all of that out, 0.3 times 0.3 times um, a 1%, a prevalence of 1%. And we said, why did you, where did these 2.3s come from? Where did you, why did you come up with 2.3s to, um, to get this small number? And they gave us an answer, which didn't really make much sense to us. And, you know, we're primary care physicians. We didn't necessarily carry much, much weight in the biostatistical world. Um, so we kind of gave our reasons for why we thought this was incorrect, but it didn't carry much weight. So we thought we'd go out and get some outside opinions. And we sent, the, we sent this thread, basically, this email thread we've been having with this state leader with their calculations to some researchers at the University of Washington who had helped us originally with this whole idea of why you need two tests and why it should be seven days or six days between the two tests or six days after arrival, why that's the safest. Anyway, um, they stepped up to the plate. One of them is... Um, uh, an assistant or I guess an associate professor who was a lecturer in biostatistics and another one's a head of a department of infectious disease. And they put their heads together and they kind of gave us some answers. And if I lose anybody in the math, the short answer is the real answer is somewhere between three and nine per thousand, not one. Now three to four per thousand is what our physicians had been saying. And we've been basing that on a pretty straightforward calculation, which is essentially this. Um, the disease process is from the day you get the disease, that's day one, you catch the virus, you incubate it for three to four days, and somewhere between four days and six days, the viral load is big enough to get picked up by a test, and it's big enough to make you sick. So your sickness begins more on day six or seven, but you've actually been carrying the virus since day one. So when somebody gets a test, a pretest, so to speak, in one point in time, there's a good chance you're going to be in that first four days or five days. And as a matter of fact, even on day eight of the illness, 20% will be false negative. So when they calculate this out, they know that's about means that about 40% of people will be missed with a single pretest. And it's pretty straightforward math. And that's what we just kept coming back to. Wait, it's 40%. It's not this 0.3 times 0.3. So number one, they agreed. That's absolutely correct. It's um, you need, to, you need to multiply that by that same number, this 0.3 or 0.4%. Um, that gives you the number that's missed just because you're still incubating the, virus, incubating the virus. The second reason that things are missed is there's actually what they call a false negative in the test. Sometimes the, the test is only about 85 to 90% accurate, even the PCR, the most accurate of them. So there are times when it should have been positive, but it's negative, not because of incubation, just because of the testing itself. Maybe the swab wasn't good enough or whatever, but there is a certain percentage that's just incorrectly negative. So there's this false negative and you put the two of them together and the number is certainly like 40% are gonna be missed. Then they raise some other points, which are interesting. 
So the 1% that the state was using, they apparently took off the California case incidents. So what that is, is the number of people that they picked up that have active infection at any given time. So for example, right now, I just looked at it this morning, it's something like, something like 550,000 active cases and 39 million people. And if you, you calculate that out, that gives you a case incidence right now of about um, 1.3. So it's not even one anymore, it's rising, it's 1.3. But they said, it, what's important to know that's a case incidence. That's the number of people that came in for one reason or another to get their test. Either they felt sick or their contact tracing or somebody was worried about them. And some of them are just regular surveillance, but there's a reason for those people to get checked. They know that in the general population, the number is much larger than that. And everybody's been talking about it. There are all these asymptomatic cases or mildly symptom. They you thought you had a cold or you just didn't think you felt well. And they think that number is somewhere between three to 10 times greater, this is what we, they would call the infection prevalence than the case prevalence. Case prevalence, they found it because they had a positive test and there was a reason to do it. Infection prevalence is just what's in the general population. So if you took that 1% that we're using as a really conservative number that's not even real right now because we know it's 1.3% in California and you multiply it by this three to 10 times, you end up with a huge number that could be coming in with this um, per thousand people on, you know, not under, not found by a single pretest. Um, so that essentially was their reasoning. They had a third point too, which was, in, and it's interesting. I'm saying this in 10 minutes. They have an eight page paper putting all of this out into, and I'll, I'll send you a copy of it if you like. We keep saying to make it simpler. This is too complicated, but these guys, they live in numbers. That's all they know how to how to speak about is uh, these massive numbers. But the other thing, the other point they made, which was kind of interesting, is, you know, when we're talking about an infection prevalence, the, pre the people that travel don't really fit into that same group. The people that travel are kind of selected out because they feel well. So you're actually taking the group of people who may be infected because they're incubation period or they're asymptomatic, and you're selecting for that group. So the group that's coming traveling is going to have an even higher incidence of people being in this pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic period than a general group of people who may or may not be sick, if that makes certain sense. So there's a certain skewing of the population to generally bring in this kind of person that fits into this asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, and that would drive the number up even further. But basically, when they put all of this together in this eight-page document that they created, they they feel that the, a, a pretty safe number to use is somewhere around nine per thousand would come in undetected by a single pretest. So then the second thing that happens, and I think you guys have talked about this on the show, they've been doing that surveillance. They did some surveillance on Kauai and they did some on the Big Island. And they've been saying, you know, look at our surveillance numbers, they're really low. This means that we've been correct. We're, um, we're finding just what we thought we would find. Um, several issues with that, which I'm pretty sure you've discussed on the show, but the test they're using over there is an antigen test. Antigen test is not as accurate as the PCR. And not only that, it takes a bigger viral load for the antigen test to be positive. So if you're doing that antigen test on day two or at the airport, even worse, and first of all, you may have had your previous PCR at the airport you left from. So some of these people had it on the exact same day, but even if it was three days later, that's still not, it takes around six days between the tests, six to seven days to actually pick it up again, because you can be in that incubation period and you could be false negative. So to use an antigen test, which is less sensitive, which it takes a bigger viral load to be positive, that's even gonna make it less accurate. So they actually, uh, I don't wanna say they planned it this way, but the system they created was almost undoubtedly gonna give them the numbers that they were looking for. It kind of proves their point in a way that's, I don't think, proper. And then there's the issue of Kauai testing. Um, so we did a little surveillance on Kauai, thanks to the mayor and Janet pushing for this voluntary testing. And the numbers that I heard of the first 173, they tested voluntary testing, returning people that were coming um, across the Pacific, they had two positives. So if they had two positives out of 200, out of 1,000, that's 10 again. 
So their surveillance on Kauai actually matched um, what we were kind of expecting. Now, of course, those are really small numbers. But it, even more importantly, I think is I think today's numbers is we had 31 cases since we opened up. 25 of them been are directly related to travel, as I understand it. Three of them are people that are close uh, or in close contact with travelers, and and two I think unknown. I, I may have the two or three mixed up there, but anyway. This basically is a travel related issue that we're dealing with when you think that we had 58 cases, I think, for the first seven months, whatever it was, that time period. And now suddenly, we're exactly one month into this, we have these 30 cases, almost all travel related. And this is with a very low, you know, the number of tourists that we're going to have. This is just the beginning if this thing stays in this fashion. So, you know, in my mind, this is a total recipe for disaster. And I guess the reason that I sent that to you is it is the experts were saying, you know, you guys are correct. This is much worse than you think. These formulas are not correct. Doc, let me ask you uh, real quickly. Uh, we we kind of there's this revelation that you, that you just mentioned about the numbers being much higher than than the one in a thousand. Why do you think the the state wants to go in that direction without coming on admitting that, hey, you know, we're wrong. And I understand, you know, a lot of it is, uh, might have uh, economic reasonings behind this, because if we went with what it's being proven now, it would turn this whole thing on its head, basically. And right. I don't think they want that, right? No, I, you know, I can only say kind of what happened elsewhere. So looking at Alaska, for example, they opened up with, um, same thing as us, kind of a single pretest, and they, their numbers became astronomical, and their tourism shuts down kind of early September, so they're way out of their tourist season now, and it's exploding in Alaska. And what they, you know, their official response is, well, this was community spread; the tourists didn't really play that big a role. And you could see that this could happen here too if if they disregard this kind of math that should have been used up front. It's easy to blame it on community spread. And, because you know a tourist comes in a shop, walks out of the shop and maybe infects somebody, nobody particularly knows that that was the person that, and I don't mean a tourist can be a returning resident to here. Here on Kauai, I think 50% of those that were, um, that we've found are, have been returning residents, so, but a traveler gives it to another person and that person doesn't necessarily know where they got it, but then it becomes community spread. And we look with great interest at the Alaska numbers because Alaska is really exploding right now and their tourism is over for months. The, and it's, you know, it's just a fire that's out of control. And the official word from Alaska is these weren't tourist related mostly, these were basically community spread. But when we looked at their, the data that they collected with the Department of Health, basically it showed this number, how many they knew how they got it. And this huge number were unclosed places. They had actually no idea how they got it. So for them to, you know, come to the conclusion that this was community spread, it's kind of an easy answer. Well, you know, that's that's what we said right now, that, you know, the easiest thing to do is just blame community spread. That's why the community is getting upset because, yeah, once you deposit it, if, if the contact trace can't even go back and find its origin, it just, you know, all you have is what you have, and that's the community. Yet, you know, this thing just didn't grow in Hawaii. It came from somewhere. Yeah, no, exactly. And, they, you know, there's been some interesting research on, how they analyze, how contact tracing works. Contact tracing kind of looks, who did you get it from and who could you have given it to? Those are their two big issues. They rarely, rarely go back the next step. Who did that person get it from? And I saw some research out of Fiji, which was fascinating. They really tracked it back and they tracked it such a huge percentage it back to travelers basically coming into Fiji. So if you travel, you know, if you go back and they're saying maybe our contact tracing is backwards. We really want to know what's going on. We should keep. We should go backwards on this thing instead of forward, or you know, spend as much time going really backwards as as they do going forward. Well, it's you know, it's it requires both. Um, I think, you, and, that, and that's why the numbers of contact tracers are so important because you need that team that goes out to basically find out where it originated, but you also need that team going forward to make sure that the the virus is isolated so we don't spread it and you know uh, i agree on that i'm just saying that across the world actually there hasn't been enough emphasis on where did it really come from 
Yeah, yeah. Korea does. Uh, South Korea, they do an incredible job with, with tracing backwards. I think uh, many of the other countries do. And uh, we, we, we don't. We go first level and that's it. And uh, the Department of Health doesn't call second level contacts uh, and, and they don't. And um, for whatever reason, Today we had our ninth, we just, I'm not sure if you heard because this press release came out pretty late in the afternoon, but we had our ninth visitor come in today that uh, had received their positive test results after arriving on Kauai. That's number nine already. And, and we know that we've had a few that actually got sick. I shouldn't say a few, um, but they, we've had visitors and I'll call them travelers too, because this is returning residents. Uh, you know, the Vegas, the Vegas, do you see Vegas, by the way? My Lord, this place is, uh, they, they, it's like they don't have COVID. If you go down the, down the downtown, I, saw, I was watching some videos on Facebook. It's like, there's no, no, no COVID. Uh, but anyway, California shutting down, Oregon shutting down. Uh, they, a lot of these states now are shutting down because the, the, the numbers are, are burning up and, and yet they're coming here. Um, but we know that the majority of the cases are uh, traveler related, travel related. And when you look at the numbers for Kauai, like you pointed out, the, the, the 10 per thousand probably is uh, more accurate. Um, but that, that's scary. That's because for every thousand passengers, uh, travelers that arrive on the island, gosh, you know, that's like a hundred a uh, hundred cases. Is my math correct? Or that sounds kind of high, but for every thousand, no, every thousand is. No, no, 10. I'm sorry. Yeah. So for, for every thousand is 10. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Jeez. So 10 and we, we typically get what, uh, 1200, 1300 passengers a day coming in 1400 passengers a day. So on a worst case scenario, well, I shouldn't even say worst case scenario. We're looking at possibly about 10, 11, 12, 14, 15 cases a day that's coming in undetected. And we're wondering why uh, the numbers are jumping all over the country and that's exactly why these people are running around asymptomatic and, uh, and spreading the virus, spreading the virus. And um, it, I don't know what the, the, the post arrival testing to me is vital. And I know the, the mayor just asked the governor to uh, reconsider his original request, but the request is only for a second test three days after arrival. Right. Do you have any idea what what that would do to the numbers? Uh, it, I mean, obviously, be it would reduce the numbers of people that um, come through undetected, but probably not that significantly, right? Yeah, um, you know, I had those on the tip of my tongue at one point. Um, we calculated it out, it would be, it's sevenfold safer if you wait till seven days. And I think it's like threefold safer if you'd go on 72 hours. So that's still a fair number that would come in at 72 hours. It's certainly, you know, better than nothing, but it is sevenfold safer was the math that I remembered now, uh, if you wait the seven days. Um, and it's interesting, I just, Vermont just went to this a seven day system. So Vermont just, and I think they announced it just today. You have a choice when you come to the state of Vermont, 14 day quarantine or seven days uh, with a second test after seven days. And Vermont's been very interesting. They, I speak of it because that's where I went to college and grew up to some degree. The, um, they've been very good. That state's been good, but they're having an increase now that's making them worried. So they wanted to cut back. But the other thing that Vermont's seen, which is fascinating is just what we talked about for here is large numbers of people coming to live there for a while. I just wanted to escape the cities and they're kind of recreating their little towns in a certain way. And they're, you know, I don't know enough about the detail of it, but they kind of embrace the idea. Let these guys, if they want to safely come in and follow our guidelines, because um, we don't have our normal tourism here, we're okay with this kind of different kind of person coming in to be safe for a while. And I do think that there is a market for that, particularly as the mainland is, you know, the numbers, I'm, I'm sure you're following these, but I think 17 days ago, they were at 9 million. Then 10 days ago, they were at 10 million. And then one, and now one week later, we're at 11.2 million. I mean, the, the increase is just astronomical. And unfortunately, the people coming here are coming to escape to some degree that 
or coming to play. And either way, it's kind of dangerous in a certain way. If this is going to be a playground for people that are escaping, you just know there's a certain percentage that are going to be coming sick and they want to be, they want to have fun here. Well, you know, we, I made this comment the other night with Dr. Berman and that, that that's what we're, we're getting with the word that we're getting is that many are, are really uh, trying to escape the, just the massive uh, increases of the spread where, where whatever state they're coming from. The, the problem that we see also is that like anything else with COVID fatigue that everybody has gone through, these people feel that sense of relief once they touch down that, thank God I'm in Hawaii. So that's when they're, um, that's when they themselves become complacent, not wearing a mask and, you know, just walking around and, and doing whatever they want to do. And so it's kind of like a two edged sword. Now we got people that are relieved. Um, I, I, I firmly believe, I don't think that they, they purposely want to get anybody infected, right. but I don't think they themselves even know if they're infected or not. Right. right. Especially coming like from a state like uh, California, how that that's blown up now. And so they're coming in and then, you know, we're just talking about places um, like, uh, uh, you know, talking about Washington state, their, their numbers are blowing up now. And so, you know, it's, it's this continual, it's this, this continual climb that there's, and there's nothing in sight. So, you know, when these people come to Hawaii, they're, they're just walking freely knowing that for that split moment in time, we're, we're going to forget about our home because, right. you know, we have to that we're afraid but at the same token they forget that hey you got people living here that you could possibly spread it if you if you came from a place that's pretty much you know it's almost like a one-for-one one deal you're at the airport there's almost a guarantee you you're gonna you're gonna get tagged by this virus no i know and i you know if i think free think it it's so much more important for us to keep our schools open than have a thousand visitors a day I just can't believe the economy of a thousand visitors a day makes up for the loss of economy of us guys, you know, going out to the restaurants and all like we were before and not so much anymore. And the schools are such a big issue. I mean, it's so difficult for parents to work if their kids are home yep. and not only that, but for the children, in my mind, it should come back to how, what's the safest way, speaking as a pediatrician here, but what's the safest way that we can keep the kids in school? And this is not the safest way. You know, I heard there's a case in Kilauea, I think, today, and there's other, anyway, there's been discussion about other places suddenly getting worried, and it's just going to get worse and worse. So in my mind, number one priority should be, how do you keep the schools open? How do you keep them as bubbles of safety? I was reading an article today that talked about open schools is much more important than eating inside. And then what they were making the argument is close the bars and inside eating. And, hope, and to make sure that you can keep your schools open because they play such a big issue in, in the economy and in the mental health of the children. Uh, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I think, you know, th th this is one of the things that at some point down the road when, when they uh, do the studies, you know, how they always find out after the fact, they're gonna find the, the damage that was caused by not allowing the kids to go to school, um, you know, the social, emotional issues i mean we hear it all the time from our from parents now it's getting more prevalent because the, the longer they stay out that girl uh that wrote that article in the in the paper uh, amazing the junior in Waimea high school rain uh silva was it silva right palama. Uh, palama palama so she will be coming on our show i just spoke a uh, message with her mom but you know, that's, that's going to be an impact that we got to deal with. Um, I did want to answer a few questions. Someone asked about how does the county count the weeks in order to determine the tiers? It's a rolling seven day period. So it's, it's, it's any rolling, it's the last seven days. Let's just say that in the last seven days, what was the average daily uh, active case count? Um, and after that seven day period, um, they need to maintain that seven, that, that, a high number for two weeks before the governor will allow our mayor to to go to the next tier. So uh, it's a rolling seven day period. And then the other thing I wanted to touch on, and you kind of touched on it, was the surveillance testing that um, that the state claimed to have done. The, the fifteen thousand tests, they only had eighteen positives. Uh, that 
as we found out, was uh, 15,000 tests that were performed at Big Island at Kona Airport, which really truly was not surveillance testing. The whole idea was they were gonna they were gonna try to get 20% of the visitors to take a second test uh, after four days uh, after arrival, and in fact. The 15,000 tests were done immediately. Like you said, it could have been hours, just less than a day after the first test was done. Uh, the whole purpose, I think, for that, and, and if I, I watched uh, Mayor Caldwell's press conference today on Oahu, he's pushing for all the residents of Honolulu to go. They're doing surge testing. They got 16,000 kits that they want to do. They want to, everyone to take this test. They, they even said, you can come and take the test more than once. If you're not comfortable and you... You know, you can come and take another test again a day or two or three later. I This is what I'm thinking really horribly right now. But I think what they're doing is they're trying to establish this uh, infectious rate, drop the rate as low as possible. So I know for Honolulu, uh, Mayor Caldwell really wants to open up before Thanksgiving. But that's not real accurate. You know, the, we test 16,000 of the visitors before you go test 16,000 residents who have, have come in no contact with no one, have, you know, just because they're, they're uh, concerned and, they, and they're, they just wanna go take a test. Uh, so the numbers that they use uh, really, really, I think disingenuous and misleading, which is causing a problem with, uh, everyone can see through it though now. I mean, they, they realize that that those numbers are, are, are just out there and, 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 and they're trying to keep that infectious rate low so we can move on to the next tier and open up more. Yeah. I don't get it, Doc, I don't get it. I mean, just if the first test, you know, from the trusted partner of the pretest was a PCR, which is the more accurate test and detects a lower viral burden, and then they come to the airport, could be six hours later and they get this antigen test, which is not as sensitive and takes a bigger viral load. So in other words, it would have to be the next day or the next day or even six days from now before that test became positive. They were bound to find almost nobody because they'd already screened them with pretests and then they were using this less accurate test that takes another day to two days or so to be positive. And there was an interesting article that just came out today saying that the antigen test is not a good screening test in that fashion. The antigen test could be a screening test um, because it's faster and simpler and so on if you were testing every day in a population, like a school population or something. But if you use it as a single test in time to use for screening, they're saying this does not meet that need. And I remember when uh, Dr. Fauci was on the phone, you know, being interviewed by Josh Green, he kind of gulped when Josh said something about we're going to do this with a single pretest. He said, you know, it's not going to be that accurate. And then Josh said something about, um, well, we're going to do the surveillance testing. And he Fauci, in my mind, kind of weakly said, well, you know, that would be an improvement. But I think if he'd known it was an antigen test, it's going to be most, many of them the same day. And I don't know that for sure. I, I just heard that these were airport ones. I'm just assuming that many of them were the same day. But I don't think he would have been quite as quick to say that that was a good system. The, the other thing, remember when he came out with the 15,000 and the 18 positives, that was at the time Kauai had already identified 12 positives. Right, and that's where Charlie, the the mathematician that Charlie is, came up with the the uh, number of uh, four out of a thousand based on the numbers. If we had twelve and the rest of the state only had six, based on the amount of visitors, that's how Charlie came out with the with his number, which was uh, pretty much what your group came out with, the, about four per thousand. Yeah, not the study, up. but the group. The four per thousand, I think, is. You know, a no-brainer. For sure, it's in the range of four. Yeah, at least, at least. I, yeah. I pray that these guys are correct that it's closer to ten, but I'm, but the four is really a real number, I think. Yeah. Hey, Doc, I, I wanted to ask you. You know, there's there, there was this uh, startling, uh, and I like to use the word uh, uh, revelation again, because <laughs> our good friend uh, Dr. Lauren Pang, uh, 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 health officer extraordinaire beyond the, the certain galaxy out there. But his claim is, uh, and, we're, and we're still trying to understand this, for Maui, they want to do a post-departure surveillance test. Can I get comments from you? What do you think about that? Because, you know, from a very simplistic point, let me say for me, I say, nay, brother is leaving. Who cares? You know, I don't know how it's going to help us. But, I mean, if you, 
if you want to show, yeah, you, you got them, but I, I would just say, you know what, why don't you just find out what state they came from? Then I can tell you more or less. Yeah, they had, because that state is blowing up right now. <laughs> You know, in terms of a study, sure, it would be interesting because you're getting them, say, six days later, and that's the time period we'd like to get them for. And I guess in a certain way, they might like it because they don't have to deal with them. They may, I'm not sure what kind of test they were going to use, but I'm guessing they may not have the answer until they're already home again. So they don't even have to worry about the airplane flight. But in terms of practical ways for us to keep our state safe, that's just a study. And I don't think we need another study. I think the data is really, really solid. We need to go we need a mandatory quarantine. That quarantine should be seven days and a second test, period. And, you know, I mean, here's all this talk about the vaccine may come. If we're going to have a vaccine in four months or so, put the energy into keeping the kids in school and to having our local economy do well. And even, you know, this kind of elitist tourism, if we want to talk about it, advertise ourselves as a place that we're going to welcome you if you, if you follow our guidelines, if you do your seven-day quarantine. I wouldn't be surprised prize at all if we could have a you know a certain number that come here to be here for that safety that we're advertising and i know other islands are doing it cayman islands i think it's doing that same thing they're advertising them as a place to come and be safe do your remote stuff from here and it would be a whole you know i i hate to say it but i walk around and i don't feel friendly to anybody i see who doesn't look like they've been living here for a while i mean it's <laughs> just kind of instinctive but if I knew that these people had done that seven day quarantine and they had their second test and maybe for a while they wore a little yellow bracelet or something, I'd feel totally different. I would feel, okay, you know, these guys are coming here because they want to respect our desire to be safe. And I keep coming back to the schools. If we have to close those schools down again, that harm is so much worse than the gain I think we're getting from a thousand tourists a day or whatever. Anyway, that's my opinion. You know, I just got this report, um, and I'll share it. I, I shared one couple nights ago. But what's happening with Maui right now, they just got a report. They just had two positive come in. But because that quarantine setup they have at the airport, where they can take only so many people, they have trailers there at the airport site to uh, quarant uh, isolate them um, because it is full. Uh, what they do is they just tell them, well, wherever you're going, just go and make sure you isolate. And there's, there's no real follow-up after that. That's been a major, major concern that Maui has. So, you know, what's to say, because um, I understand we had one that flew in the, uh, I want to say the other night, but I could be wrong, but flew into Kauai from Maui that didn't have a test and was dropped off by an Uber on the west side. And so, we're, you know, we're trying to follow up on that, on that because that, if the person didn't have a test, and if uh, supposedly they had a pretest, but um, that person didn't understand that that one test that they take from the mainland is not good for all islands, it's only good for the island they arrive at, and then they have to take the inner island test, then I think that puts us in a world of hurt trying to find that person whether they're hunkered down or not. At right. a location. And if they're not hunkered down, then that's where the danger. And you know, yeah. there's so many places. There's only so many, so many places you can go on the west side. Ole Hale, Koke'e, Big Safe, Wranglers, Ishiharas. I mean, you know, that's that's the only places you're talking about. Right. So right. we kind of put the community like, uh-oh, oh, okay, everybody stop. We, we got to rethink now. The um, You know, and I, I've said this before, but there that there's that Perseus app that's out there that's been developed worldwide, but then kind of... Um, you know, created for Hawaii also, or recreated for Hawaii. Those apps for tourists really can work. And I think that, we, you know, we have technology. Everybody's got their smartphones. You would say to a tourist for the, you know, for 30 days, whatever, 14 days, you need to have this app on your phone. It's a contact, it's a tracer, and it can geofence. So they can, you can put in there, even a TBR, the TBR, and they, if they leave the TBR, it alerts somebody. I, for me, I would go in that direction. I would, uh, even use some of the CARES money if necessary, but I would go, I'd put the app in place so that we could make sure, you know, we don't have to drive ourselves nuts trying to make sure these people are quarantining properly for their seven days, put the second test in place. And on Kauai, we were so close to it. I mean, the mayor had gotten a second test that they could do, you know, we were inches away. I, 
the 72 hours is not long enough. I mean, it really does need to be seven days, but that we were on the right path for this thing and we could have done it. It's, I keep thinking that I can understand why a governor can put emergency powers to keep a place safe, but to use the emergency powers to make a place less safe, just seems, seems really wrong to me that you could use those emergency powers to make the neighbor islands less safe than they were before. I agree. And, and, you know, we've been saying that, you know, you, you wonder how far does his authority, uh, you know, in any jurisdiction, the, the governing rule, the governing law, whether it's a state law, it allows the lower municipalities to uh, enact a law that is stricter than the, the mother law. Uh, that's kind of standard in, in legislatures that you can always tweak it to make it stricter. You cannot make a, a state law less strict. Uh, in a case like this, uh, for the life of me, I cannot understand why, how, and, and under what authority does the governor have to not allow the mayors uh, of each county to dictate what is what is safest for, for their island, unless it was to loosen up a state rule, uh, if it was to make it less strict, if it was to in other words, if the governor had ruled that we needed a seven-day quarantine, and then, then I can see how the mayor of Kauai couldn't do a three-day quarantine. But to make it stricter, I don't, you know, I, I don't see the issue, but, but it has become an issue. And this governor's hard head. He just doesn't listen. And he doesn't listen to the experts. He doesn't listen to, to anyone. And it's putting us in a very tough position now. I see Derek is, again, asking one more time, you know, if the if the if the governor rejects Derek's second request for the and granted it's only a three day quarantine, uh, gosh, man, that that really to me borders negligence when if something should happen on Kauai because of travel and um, I I don't know why the governor would do that. Uh, I would agree. I've always said six, Doc. I I uh, I would agree with you that it. I'll go with seven days. It should be seven days. The, the quarantine should be seven days. And then you take a second test. That, that pretty much keeps it, keeps it safe. Uh, yeah. And then, of course, enforcing the, and, and the apps, you know, we've seen, we've had a couple of presentations on our show from apps, different apps, and they work. We just have elected not to use them in this state, which baffles me. Yeah, no, me too. And that, you know, the safe travel app they have is such a primitive app that doesn't work very well. It's like paper on your phone in a certain way. It's just uh, amazing that that's what the one they decided the correct thing. You know, I wondered if I could talk a little about schools. Please. Uh, yes, please. please. So there's been issues brought to our attention about um, kind of a lack of uniformity in what happens in the classrooms. And I think a little of the history was when they first talked about opening schools back in the summer, they had this idea, which came somewhere from somebody in the Department of Health, that they could create bubbles in the classroom where in the classrooms, you didn't have to wear a mask. That would be your bubble. And the pediatricians on Kauai all got together and wrote a letter and um, kind of with the blessing of Janet Behrman, who, who also was very worried about this, who's also a pediatrician. And we wrote a letter saying, wait a minute, the CDC guidelines and the American Academy of Pediatric guidelines is you need a mask in the classroom. You, that's not a bubble. Those, that bubble is as fragile as all of the families of all those people. You can't consider that a safe bubble. So back in the summer, all of the pediatricians, I think on the island wrote a letter to the Department of Education saying, reconsider this. If you're gonna open these schools, do it properly and have masks in the room. And then I don't think any of us really thought much about it, but then when things opened up again school-wise, we've been hearing all of these stories that some of the classrooms have masks in them and some of them don't. But they say you're in the classroom, it's your bubble, or you're six feet apart, you don't need a mask. And the second issue that comes up, which is really interesting, is the, the other guideline that's strong out there is the ventilation in the classroom should be good because the best way to decrease transmission is good, fresh, outside air ventilation. So many of these classrooms apparently are good. No, you know, they have masks on, they have their, their jealousy windows open like the old days and that's what you need to do. But a fair number of them apparently don't. And there seems to be kind of a looseness in terms of allowing the schools to make their decisions about this. And I, so the physicians wrote another letter that went out about 10 days ago. It was a lot of pediatricians and other doctors too that said, 
wait a minute, guys, the guidelines are really clear. You need to wear masks in the classrooms and you want to optimize ventilation. And the optimizing ventilation is kind of a new recommendation. The CDC and whatever have gotten much more aggressive about pushing that. The bottom line is every classroom should have masks on in the classrooms, whether you're six feet apart or not six feet apart, and you ought to have all the windows open. And there's even you know suggestions about putting an exhaust fan in some of those windows just to kind of move the air through. But they ought to be well ventilated and they need to be masks. And I think anybody listening to this, if your kids are in a classroom where they're not doing that, I'd speak up. Um, they really ought to be. And I'm kind of appalled that there's even latitude to this. If I was a superintendent of schools, I would just say, not so much on Kauai, I mean statewide, saying that. Um, you know, it's not up to the individual schools. This is just the way it ought to be. These are the, are the recommendations, both from the Department of Education, um, certainly from the CDC and from the American Academy of Pediatrics. So I just throw that in. I don't know if this has come up as a subject before in here. No, no, it, it has. It, uh, thank you. You know, uh, I'm repeating it. I'm sorry. That's, that's right. No, we, we, we discussed it and I, I, I mentioned that, you know, what the school should have done is brought in the experts about uh, ventilation dynamics, you know, yeah. how it goes, because I said that if, you know, if you have an exhaust and there is a creation where you have windows on one side and just one doorway, it's going to funnel through towards that doorway. So you wouldn't want to put a kid closest to that doorway. Right. 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 And, but, but they just felt that, Oh, if we put up plastic shields on every desk, we, we are sufficing. We, we are meeting the, we are meeting the standards. And I said, not if somebody's walking around and they're above the top level of that, that, that plate. I said, it will go right over. So all of these things, we, we've, we've, been pounding, we've been pounding the beat saying, hey, hasn't anybody gone into individual schools, look at the way it's set up and make a recommendation? Because I like, you know, like exhaust. That's uh, because it goes hand in hand with airplanes. Because we say, well, airplanes are not safe. No, they're safe because they have filters, the air pulls down to the floor, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and, and it doesn't allow it to circulate. That's, that's what they say. But yeah, we looked at the Purdue study. It didn't show that. It showed when the study showed from row 16, how, how much it spread to all the way to the front and all the way to the back in a relatively short period of time. I think it was a, a 15 to 20 minute scale. And it showed how the the particles drifted in either direction. So, uh, you know, one person brought it to our mind who's a, who happens to be a master ma uh, aircraft mechanic. And he says, Charlie, you got to figure this now. If we're trying to pull air, then you ask yourself, how do we equalize the pressure in the plane? <laughs> so, he, so your eardrums don't bust out. I said, and yet at the same time, we're trying to pull air. That's relatively hard to do. So let, let me tell you something, you know, One's going to be more prevalent than the other. And he says, I can tell you right now, just like when, and I, uh, last time my wife got mad at me when I used the, um, the analogy that, you know, if somebody farts in a plane, you're going to smell it. Okay. It's not being pulled away. So this time to save out from getting scoldings, I'm just going to say, if you got a woman that has very strong perfume, you're going to be able to smell it. It's going to be floating there for a while. It doesn't dissipate. There's no way. And that's and that's what he brought you know brought to our attention on one of our discussions. So I think the same applies to the classroom. They they've got to get somebody that has the expertise that can go in there and make it safe for the kids. But right now they're just saying put up plastic shields. That's good enough. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, as much outside class. I mean, we're so lucky in a way we can actually have outside classrooms. So that. Great. You know, right. Well, you remember when they first came out, the first recommendation was three feet apart. Remember when the, the first uh, for schools was three feet? Like, really? Yeah. Are you guys crazy? You know, I think that's where the importance of the statewide standard where, it, you know, the principals don't have a choice. It, it's no, your, your only obligation is to comply with the state mandate. And, and that is the only way. Uh, because if, if, all of these things considered, ventilation and, and the masks are probably the most, the simplest, most uh, effective way to prevent the spread of this virus, as well as a disinfecting and, and the social distancing. So if one principal feels that uh, if it's too hot, you know, they can take off the mask or if, if 
that 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 the whole equation is is no good no more. The whole the formula is is no good no more because that that's a huge component. Yeah. Um, and you know if you have the ventilation, and and every student and and every faculty and every staff person has a mask, uh, it's going to drastically reduce the spread. And um, but you're right, doc, because we hear it from parents that they are telling us. You know, my one of my uh, kids' teachers said they don't have to wear a mask because the uh, windows are open. But no, that's not true. While that helps, you still need the mask. And um, so, I, you know, I was hope, hoping that we would get that kind of leadership from the state level at the DOE, from the superintendent, but she, she punted, you know, she punted to the principals. And I just read one post from uh, a school teacher, a former school teacher that said that's part of the problem is is allowing the principals to make the calls for the individual schools rather than the a statewide criteria. You know, I was amazed when I, and we wrote some letters to different superintendents and I was, that was the answer we got, you know, there's, there's lo these are local issues. And I thought, this is not a local issue. <laughs> this is, these are, you know, countrywide recommendations from, from everybody that's important about this. This should not be a local issue at all. This should just be the way it is. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I'm just reading some of the comments. Trying to get see if I get some questions for you, Doc, before we sign off. Um, I, I I can only hope that something drastically changes in the next couple of weeks. I, I'm very, very genuinely afraid, as I'm hearing from uh, visitor industry people, that the bookings uh, from you know for after Thanksgiving into Christmas. Is out is nuts. It's 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 growing. It's uh, these hotels are going to be seeing you know 70, 80 percent occupancies, uh, which means we are going to probably see you know four times here because I think right now hotels probably 20, 30 percent. Some of them are doing much better, but if we're if we if we're going to quadruple the amount of travelers coming into Kauai, uh, and you look at the numbers we have now, uh, we're in we're in for some some big trouble. That short-term gain, economic gain, like you said, Doc, a thousand. What's the economic benefit for a thousand visitors that stop at Costco, load up their wagons, and stock their refrigerators, and never smell the restaurant? They, you know, they're cooking their stuff at home or in their in their hotel or in their condo. Economic impact is not going to outweigh the value of uh, keeping the kids out of school, and that's where we're headed. Though we're headed to, for another shutdown, another lockdown. No, I mean, I keep thinking that it's um, it's magical thinking to think that the mainland can be doing so badly. And I, you know, there are at least 28 nations, if not more, that don't allow Americans in at all. And we're just saying, okay, come to us. And there's not that many places they can travel to. So of course they're gonna come to us. And it's just, it's totally magical thinking to think it can be that bad in the mainland and and that we're gonna do okay. It's just, no, it's completely illogical. I, I tell you, I tell you what the, those in the upper government here in Hawaii are thinking. They're saying that while there's a massive breakout in the rest of the U.S., those travelers are the select few that didn't get <laughs> infected. So they're only allowing the few that's not infected to fly to Hawaii. <laughs> Picked up by the single pretest. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, uh, think about it. If you were in a state that was on fire right now, blowing up, and everything is on lockdown, you cannot work because you're 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 shut down. And and you, and remember, I don't know if you guys get in those emails of all the low fares that going around. If you belong yeah. to any mileage program, you you're getting those emails. Can you imagine that coming home and telling the wife, honey? Let's get the heck out of here. Look, look at Hawaii. It's $292 round trip. It's we take a test here. We don't have to go to quarantine. Uh, let's go. And they're coming. And more will come as more states shut down and more states lock down. And we are here with open arms. And uh, it was so funny last night on uh, what I think it was uh, Wheel of Fortune. I can't remember what it was a game show on TV last night. And it, obviously it was during the present time during COVID and somebody wanted to get the host mentioned, he goes, yeah, you know, well, I guess you could go to Hawaii and spend 14 days in a hotel room. 
I was kind of surprised to hear that, but that's not the case. They're, they're promoting this. The airlines are promoting the test. You can take this test and escape quarantine. And it's, you know, so yeah, 292 round trip, you pay 150 bucks for the test. You can escape to Hawaii for two weeks and just enjoy yourself. And, and they're buying it. And, and, and our state is doing nothing to, uh, to counter that message. They, they're actually condoning that and, they, and they're welcoming it. And that's scary for me, very, very oh, scary. And I, you know, I just, I keep hearing from everybody around the island too. You go to the different towns like Hanalei and whatever, people are just, everybody's walking around without masks, which is such a big change from just a few weeks ago when all of us were, you know, at least in the towns we were taking it seriously. It just seems, you know, there's this relaxation that happens, as you said, these guys come here and think we're, we're on vacation, we're outside, whatever, and it, it's kind of self-feeding in a certain way, which is what I heard happened in Alaska too. Simultaneously with the tourists coming, they relaxed most things. Bars opened up for longer periods of time. So it was one of the reasons it was hard for them to pull it apart, you know, how much was tourism related and how much was just opening up, this general opening up. And then to combine this with Thanksgiving and Christmas and all of the get togethers that we, you know, we tend to have here. It is almost impossible to believe that this isn't going to end really badly unless we do something dramatic. Like, really different, really different. Yeah. This is, it's total magical thinking to think we can do what we're doing and it's not going to be a disaster. Well, you know, what's, what's becoming more frightening and we haven't heard about it, but I know um those in your profession doc um the frontline workers doctors they are just they're just about ready to throw in the towel i mean they they've got it where um they're actually talking about now triaging to the point where they're deciding who lives and who dies because there's not available bed, bed space right i mean that that was something that we were afraid of way when this thing started and then everyone, everybody was being warned, hey, we got to take it seriously because it's going to come down to that point where maybe someone with uh, uh, that had a stroke or a heart attack, they're going to need a bed. But if that bed is not available due to COVID, you know, we don't know what, what can happen. And uh, I think was it Sanjay Gupta, that Dr. Gupta even said that we can take the position of uh, bringing up or start making field, field hospitals, right? We can start building these field hospitals. The problem is you don't have the workers. You don't have enough medical staff. You don't have enough nurses. There's just not enough of them. So what do you do? Put them in a bed and, 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 and the person not get tended to. And so, you know, there's, this, there's so many things going on. And that's another thing that I wanted to comment on. And that was when we first got involved well beyond choice when pandemic was. you notice that it was always say we don't have enough tests we don't have enough tests then all of a sudden once you're ready to open up tests galore popped up from everywhere and anywhere and then you know the airline started to buy into it as as like a, another money-making venture and some were offering well we can give it to you for 250 dollars if it's three uh, 36 hour no uh, turnaround, or I mean, uh, for a, for a same day test, or ninety ninety dollars at a 36 hour turnaround. So it it tells me that as we went in, we only had maybe like a handful of trusted partners, and then everything just exploded one time where we couldn't even take care of the local traveler trying to go from one island to another because there are not enough test sites, and that started to become a pain in and of itself. So to me, all all around, it's just everything was just poorly planned. It was just nothing was set up properly. You know, the staffing is really important. And that's what I'm reading across the country is these rural areas, North Dakota and whatever. And even here, I think when we were the worst in July, they were bringing in people from elsewhere because you could get them. But that's disappearing rapidly that you can bring in people easily to work in other places because every place is becoming overloaded. So you just... Um, you know, this idea that we're going to be able to staff because we can attract people to come work here is, I mean, we're, we, we are Hawaii, so we're a little more attractive, but that, that pool that we would draw from is shrinking rapidly across the country, and it's only going to get much worse. I mean, we went up another million, 1.2 million cases in just the last seven days in the mainland. 
you know, it's just, and if you think about it, I, you know, I think it was three months when we went from zero to 1 million in the mainland originally. And now seven days and we went 1.2 million and it's just, you know, this curves go like this. And every time you start from a higher place, you end up going much, much higher um, from the, the step that you just took. Right. We are in an unbelievable, and then, you know, you add to that our kind of national issues of some people not wanting to wear masks and this whole issue going that became so political, which is so unfortunate, but it's just feeding into this, the politics in these areas that we're just, you know, if we just look at Asia and how well Asia has done with this, they're not dealing with it in any way like we're dealing with it because they pulled together, they did what needed to be done, they wore their masks, they did their testing. It's such a shame that this became so political in America. I had expected us to come together, uh, the country. I, I had expected, even the state, I had expected that. And, um, you know, we, we, the, what bothers me is a lot of the things that need to be done don't require permission from the federal government. Um, a lot of the things that can and should be done is uh, our decisions that can be made by our local state leaders. That That's the frustration, Doc. It's, uh, you can't blame no one else. It's, you know, we have an opportunity to do things here to make uh, make it safe and, and we're ignoring it. And I think it's that magical thinking that you talk about that they think that something is, uh, is different about us from the rest of the world and it's not. And I think we're gonna see some really ugly numbers going forward. The, the governor of Oregon spoke on, uh, I believe it was on Friday. I listened to her press conference and she, you know, her biggest concern was the fact that they will not have, like you just mentioned, they won't, they won't have resources to pull from. They will not be able to borrow uh, hospital rooms or staff from other neighboring states to come and help because they are not available anymore because everyone is, is, uh, the numbers are, are climbing. Uh, not that we ever had that because we can't just drive to another neighboring state, but uh, we did have an opportunity to fly in <clears throat> nurses and, and um, healthcare people, but that they're all stuck at their home base now. Yeah, and it's you know, I know it's so clear what will happen too is if it gets here and it gets into our hospital system, staff's gonna get sick. You're gonna have whole wards, you know, that need to be quarantine for four days and you're going to have those shortages it's just um it you know you can kind of see it all right laid out in front of us what's kind of bound to happen if we pretend that we can bring all these people in with the activity rate well you know let's 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 just look at uh, an example um the secret service as an example they're they're tasked with protecting the president right the president's detail, 130 of them all got COVID. So they get taken out of the mix. Right. So now you got to go grab 130 newer agents who maybe haven't worked that particular detail. Now throw them into the mix right, right from the get-go. And that's the same thing that can happen to uh, frontline workers. They start getting sick. Slowly those numbers dwindle. You don't have any replacement, right? You're stuck. You're stuck. Absolutely. And I and the shame of it all is because of our geographic isolation, we really could be very different. I mean, we are different than Vermont and New York and whatever. We really could close the boundary or open it just like we need to open it and be this kind of unusual place. And particularly when I keep thinking four months from now with a vaccine, it may be very different you know, where we can protect a big section of the population. And who knows, the vaccine may not be as good as we're hoping, but it could be. And mm -hmm. I would say, do what it takes to be safe for that time period. Um, some kind of gentle, safe opening that we could do, I think, and just do it. Just has to be done. <laughs> mandate what the schools need to do, mandate what we need to do. If we have to opt out of this plan, so be it, you know, opt out of it, meaning that we have to say, okay, for right now, we're not accepting a free test. A single free test is good enough. Give us something else or we just go back to 14 days. And I, I don't know enough about the politics of this, of course, but I, I, you know, maybe that's all we have to, maybe that's our only option. But I think the option of not, of just going along with the state leadership is just a recipe for disaster. 
I'm curious to see what will happen with uh, with the mayor's request. I, I wouldn't put it past Derek that if the mayor rejects this request that um, he, he may strongly consider um, opting out. Uh, that's what I would do. I mean, I, I would, that's what I would do. I mean, you, you give the governor an opportunity to, to at least make it better. He chooses not to, then, then you got to do what you got to do to protect your people. And, and to me, opting out right now with, with what's happening would, would be the, the practical thing to do, um, really. And I know and I, the, a lot I, of the, the visitor industry would, would, are not, maybe not supportive of that, but at the end of the day, uh, we, we won't have a second chance you know, we won't have a second chance to to correct this wrong. You, this is the time to do it because the states are, are uh, the main line is, is, is burning up and we cannot afford with our demographics here, with our island, with our resources. We cannot afford that here. We cannot, people will die. No, for sure. And, and we have the opportunity. I, I have a tremendous amount of faith and um, respect for the job that the mayor and Janet Fairman have done. So I'm hoping that's what happens too. I, you know, I'm hoping that you know the approaches that we gave their plan a chance, and look what happened: 30 cases in 30 days, and we're just beginning to get people in here, and we're just beginning to see them too. Because, you know, as you know, there's always a two-week lag, a two-week lag in the number of cases, and a two-week lag in hospitalization, and a two-week lag in deaths. So if we have these 30 cases in just 30 days with this slow increase in tourism. You know, we gave it a chance and the chance we we're seeing right in front of our noses that this is not the way to go. Well, Doc, we hit the eight o'clock hour. Thank you very much. Any closing comments for the, the people of uh, Kauai? You know, my only closing comments to compliment you guys. You, I just cannot believe the perseverance and the dedication that you put into this show of yours that, uh, you know, it's so popular and done so well at just it blows me away, um, you know, and I think to some degree we all feel like snowflakes because we're doing all this talking and it's not changing enough, but I, I think you guys have made a difference. You, you've made this a legitimate mm -hmm. topic and you've made it something that people are freely talking about. So I, I just compliment the two of you on the job you've done. Thank, thank you, Doc. You. That means a lot, sir, from you. It means, I mean, we, thank you. Charles? Well, as always, I first would like to take this opportunity to thank our esteemed guest tonight, Dr. Lee Evzin. Thank you so much for joining us, Doc. Especially with the uh, the revelation again. I like that's that's my new word. I just love that word of that of that study that you uh, you was able to share with all of us. And to our viewers tonight, you took a snapshot in time of a of a study that was done that kind of tells us. And, and, and it's not to point fingers, but it's telling us the reality that the numbers are skewed, the numbers are off. And uh, I think the message is we, we have to try to contain and be as safe as possible because uh, we learn by experience, we learn by others' mistakes. And there's so many mistakes being made around this nation in huge numbers. I don't know why we're not learning from those mistakes. And so like Dr. Evzen said, it's going to appear on our doorsteps sooner than later. And we just have to be prepared. And uh, not to scare anyone, but if we just do our part by making sure that we distance ourselves, you know, the, the, the virus will have a very hard time coming to us. But if you go nearly and try to go up to it, yeah, you might get nicked by it. And then it, it's going to be a tough battle from then on. So I hope and pray that everybody um, heard what he had to share tonight. Uh, share with your friends later on when you get to replay this uh, this topic that we talked about tonight. Share it with your friends. Tell them, listen to the numbers that he shared. Those are real numbers from individuals that really look hard, look hard at it because thankfully the doc and his team saw something that was off. They picked up on something that just wasn't right. And that's what all good investigators do. They pick on something that's just not right and they keep on digging until they can either find the right answer <coughs> or get rid of the thought. And I think this is a worthwhile episode or a session that we had tonight. So thank you all. Mel? Thanks, Charlie. And thank you again, Doc. Uh, appreciate you coming up and sharing that in a way that we all understood. It looks like from the comments that it actually, people did understand <laughs> sometimes, you know, doctors and lawyers, man, those two, two occupations, two professions that, uh, 
uh, sometimes they gotta, you know, I hate to say dummy it down for for us guys, but uh, you did it in a way that we understood. You know, not not surprising. I'm glad it came out because it is. It's just people question what we have been told, and this uh, pretty much gives one one study anyway that that uh, sounds much more believable. And we're seeing it on Koi. We're, we're seeing the numbers on Koi. So there's no doubt in my mind that those numbers are accurate. I just wish the state would accept that and and uh, and act accordingly. So we, we shall see. Um, you know, Mel, as, Mel I can um, post that on my Facebook, the study as a Word document. And if you wanna take it and post it on yours so that anybody can read it. Absolutely. I was going to ask you if, if there was any way we could somehow share that study or where can we find it. But yeah, if you can do that, we'd appreciate it. Thank okay. you. And then, you know, Doc, you said some nice things about us. And, you know, we get every every night, even right now, everybody's saying thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, we, we just provide the platform. We just, you know, we took off on Saturday night, Doc. I got to tell you, and, and for our viewers, I felt so guilty, Charlie. I felt so guilty not being on on Saturday night. We... I told Charlie, man, let's just take off. They're not no no real developments, no sense going up there and beating a dead horse. Let's just take off Saturday and Sunday and come back Monday. And I gotta tell you, man, I felt bad. We I I saw posts, I saw messages like, uh, what happened? How come you guys not on? You know, they didn't get the message that we wouldn't be on. But you know, the, for us, this is like um, this is how. For me, anyway, I cannot speak for Charlie, but I think we're so much alike. This is how we. Uh, relieve our stress as it relates to to COVID, that we have an opportunity to bring people like yourself on and, and share facts and not fear. Uh, while we have been accused of fear mongering, um, I call us fact mongering. You know, we put out the facts and and that's, uh, we, we don't do it. We bring the experts to do it. And uh, so that's, we appreciate you so much, Doc, uh, especially the timing was right with that extra case tonight. And we'll see more, unfortunately, so. Anyway, uh, thank you all again, viewers. We will be back tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Uh, please join us. I don't know who's going to be on yet. We're trying to get rain on tomorrow, rain Palama. That'll be a nice uh, distraction from COVID. Not so much COVID, but hearing from a young person, a, a, a junior in high school that yes. is being impacted by this. So with that, everybody, God bless. You guys stay safe. We love you guys. Thank you. Good night. Aloha. Thanks, Doc.